on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hacker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. We continue our breakdown of OU's spring roster by looking at the defensive line. Then Eddie Radosevich joins us for a master's preview, and we talk a little OU spring ball with him. And we finish with our winners and losers of the week. Please download and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. Our man, Michael Hostie, will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Wednesday, April 5th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful, award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match, Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of March, it's not March, it's April, in the month of April, visit riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the best. Now we're recording this on Wednesday morning. Please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment. Ted, it's Masters Week, baby. Let's go. Oh, it's exciting times. Exciting times. Love this week. Yeah, we got OU Spring Ball going on and Masters Week. So, of course, we call upon the one, the only, Edward Radosevich. The second, the third? Is he a third? Did I see third? I think it's third. I think yeah. it's third. What a nice. What a title. What a legacy. Uh, what a legacy. So yeah, we uh we catch up with Eddie, which is always wildly entertaining. But let's let's continue our breakdown of OU's roster here in spring football and its defensive line time. Uh, I don't think that it's it's a secret that we need to see a lot of growth from this group, but Ted, you've been out to You've been out to some of spring practice. What what has stood out to you along the defensive front? Do you want to start with ends? Do you want to start with tackles? How do we want to do it? Yeah, we can start with the defensive end, guys. Um, you know, I, I think the the thing that stands out is we we're changing the roster, we're changing the bodies there. Um, we have some we look the part, I guess I should say. Um downs. Grimes, both those guys, really big. Downs, is, he's put on weight and looks incredibly strong. Um, we've got some some pass rush type bodies. Our Mason Thomas had a good offseason. He put on some weight, really looks good out there. Um, you know, we've got some young guys that have come in trying to learn their way out of Barres out there, trying to get some work in. Um, and then we've got the transfer guys. Um you got Bothroyd that's come in. You got Trace Ford that's come in. So it's a it's a pretty diverse group whenever you think of body types and skill sets. Um, now the biggest thing is we just have to get more consistent there. Um, you know, the pass rush really faded last year. Started off with the bang, and it's like, dang, this is going to be a, a super productive group. And it really faded as we got into the meat and potatoes of the of the schedule. Um, you know, R. Mason Thomas is probably the the guy to look for as 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 your premier pass rusher. He's got to take some big steps. Um, you know, just having a good get off is only going to get you so far. So he's got to technically develop. Out of has got to you know he's he's kind of a fish out of water right now, as you would expect for for a young buck coming in there with that group. Think he'll grow and develop into that role. So, I mean, just a a broad view is we've got some we got some capable guys, but we need we need vast vast improvement. Uh, I completely agree, and that's why I I don't know if pressure is the w right word, but I, I do think I do think people are going to be paying a lot of attention to Miguel Chavis because. You've got the body types, you've got the athletes, and it's up to him to coach them up and to develop them technically and 
to turn that production up for all of these guys. Like that's, that's part of being a position coach, right? Is taking what you're given and maximizing, maximizing it. So I think, I, I think Chavis is going to be under the microscope a little bit for the rest of spring throughout camp heading into the season, because you look at a guy like our Mason Thomas, I mean, guy looks awesome. What up to 240 looks much better in the uniform to get off still there. So it's up, it's up to Chavis to help him develop the technical tools to round him out as an edge player, right? He should with what we've seen, like with what he has physically, he should have a big jump in productivity. I mean, yeah. just he should, but you got to coach him up, right? And you and I, we love Chavis. Chavis, the energy is there. It's clear that the guy can absolutely recruit. I mean, the fact that they won the battle for Adebare is, is probably all you need to know. But, yeah, we're going to need to see them play with some better technique this season. I, I think as the as the production waned last year, Things on the, they got a little sloppy. It got a little sloppy. The hand usage, a, a, a lot of things, you and I, and we pointed it out on here, that, that can't happen again. You have too many good athletes out there on the edge. This group needs to be much better. And maybe the funniest part with what I've seen at spring practice is Downs and Grimes, our Mason Thomas, they look incredible, right? You're like, damn. There's some big dudes out there on the edge. R. Mason Thomas, look at the twitch. Like, that's what you want. Bothroyd, he looks the worst of all of them. <laughs> he does not look great in a jersey. But I think he's their best defensive end with what I've seen. Yeah. He's been he's making a, the most plays with when I've been out there. He's and effective. He's just, yeah, he's effective. He doesn't, he, he doesn't look like an NFL defensive end. He's a little, I don't know, he's just a little compact but uses his hands really well is super physical and every time i'm watching like he's doing something disruptive yep so it's technique and experience man that's that's what we're lacking you still talk about the like our mason thomas downs grimes obviously out of bar a still somewhat inexperienced last year was ethan downs and reggie grimes first year playing uh a solid year starting football so I mean, we've got a long way to go. If you just want to look back to a year ago um, and what we saw from the edge, incredibly too soft for how big and strong we are at edge with downs and grimes and go on down the list, too soft, getting pushed off the football. Um, not understanding exactly where we fit always slows guys down. And whenever you've slowed down, you're in danger of getting blown off the ball, uh, losing contain. That stuff happened way too much. My biggest pet peeve, rushing past the level of the quarterback and opening massive gaping holes for quarterbacks to step through and gain easy yards or easy windows to push the ball downfield. And that happens from having a lazy rush where you're just taking the path of least resistance, which oftentimes is exactly what an offensive lineman wants you to do. Is there anything easier than just running up the field and making a, a job incredibly simple for a tackle? Uh, those things we've got to fix. You have to have weapons on the edge. I've never played in or seen a great defense that doesn't have weapons on the edge. The contain of the defense in the run, and pressuring the quarterback in the pass, and it comes from these guys, this group. That's what you're there for. This is the money position. There's probably going to be, I don't know, six guys in this position drafted in the first round. This is what everyone wants. You've got to have guys on the edge. So it's this is a big year for those guys. The pressure is on for Chavis. You're right. Can you get the five-star out of bar a up to um up to snuff quickly can can he be a contributor quickly can downs and grimes be healthy and uh technically proficient you know gap sound plus be a, a threat in the passing game can bothroyd come in and and maybe we end up being the the experienced leader of the group as far as technician uh is concerned 
Can our Mason Thomas turn, turn into a, a legitimate pass rusher in the Big 12? Can Trey Ford stay healthy? Like, there's, there's a lot of questions with this group. And, you know, I, I'll just say, where we are today isn't close with where we need to be for this fall. And that's fine because we have plenty of time. We have plenty of time this spring. We've got a full summer, full training camp. We've got plenty of time to get there. I don't think anyone across the country is saying they're exactly where they want to be right now, but this group's got a lot of ground to make up. Yeah, and they got to get there, though, man. Yeah. Or because <laughs> playing great defense all starts with having a badass defensive line. Mm -hmm. If – and I'll j just speaking from experience – you can have all the stud linebackers and secondary guys on the field, but if you don't have a good defensive line, the offense ain't scared at all. Yep. Right. And they will. It, it, so that is, that's where this, that's where this group needs to get on the edge. Right? Reggie Grimes and Ethan Downs. If you're not going to be great pass rushers, you need to be dominant at the point of the attack in the run game. At your size. Yep. With the physical tools that they have. Like if, yeah, maybe you're not going to be Miles Garrett coming off the edge, right? Been in the corner. Okay. But you can't lack tools in the pass rush game and then not hold the point like a madman in the run game. Yeah. Like you, it, it, that's just, that's, it, it can't be that way. And then find your strength to become great at it find your weakness and become good at it right right and for those guys like downs he needs to be a great run defender he should be able to to shut down anything coming to his side yeah and then at a you go out there and see him i mean dude is all arms and legs right now but at, at six four and almost 240 he's probably 240 by now the upside is just i mean it's massive he he's raw. He needs he needs a lot of great coaching. And that it goes back to what we said about Chavis. Like this guy has the physical tools, but can you get him technically right to where he's contributing in I, I don't know how significant of the way, but when you get a guy like this, you have to get him ready to be out there on the field. Right with yeah. what he's got. And that's that's the rest of the spring in the weight room, the summer with Schmitty in the weight room, but also each and every day on the practice field when they're an individual. Like you have to be sharpening this guy up. You you can't sign a top whatever, what did he end up being? A top five, top ten recruit yeah. at the edge and not have him ready to play in the fall. Yeah. Those types of guys with those physical tools, they got to play and they got to contribute. It's it's really a it's a it's a really unique position. And this is why the pressure's on Miguel Chavis because you can't really think of any other uh position group out there where you have such a diversity of of talents and physical traits. So that's what makes it hard. Coaching Ethan Downs is different than coaching P.J. Adebare. They're different body types, right, that you're trying to get to do the same thing. It requires a little bit of different technicalities for each individual guy, and it's the same thing with a pass rush. Typically, um, you know, the way you work a drill is like, you know, for offensive line, your tackle's technique is – probably almost the exact same as steps and footwork and where your hand placement is and punch. You can drill the hell out of that with those guys. But whenever it comes to rushing the passer, Ethan Downs doesn't have the get off that our Mason Thomas has. Our Mason Thomas doesn't have the arm length that our Adebare has. Like, so there's all these different traits and you've got to find the best way to squeeze the most out of each individual guy and it can become difficult, but that doesn't mean that it still doesn't have to happen, right? We still got to find a way to get all those guys uh, really dialed in, uh, you know, know exactly where they need to be whenever it comes to all your blitz schemes and 
your run game stuff, where you fit, so we can get to third and long and turn some of these freaks loose. That's the ultimate goal. Third and long, turn four guys free and let them go get the quarterback and play coverage. That's what everyone wants to do. Yeah, I hear you, man. But big spring for that edge group, uh, going to be a very important summer. And production's got to ramp up, bottom line, in the fall. Or else, yep. or else this defense is not going to be near what it wants to be. That's just how it works. You got to yep. have difference makers. You have to have production along the defensive line, especially at the edge spot. And you just, yep. you just have to. All right, let's talk about the interior guys. Speaking of difference makers, does this team have one? With what you've seen, does this team have one on the interior? Not right now, but you know, we, Luckily, we're not kicking the ball off right now. We are we are in spring uh, spring ball. We've we've got a lot of time. I think the the guy that has the chance to be the most disruptive is Isaiah Coe. Now, will he take some of the strong points that he had a year ago, and and grow from that, run with it, continue to develop, uh, embrace the role as perhaps a leader and. Um, a guy that could be a centerpiece of the defense on the interior defensive line, or is he going to let the opportunity slip him by? That's what we don't know. Um, I hope he grabs it, takes it because, you know, whenever he decides to go, he's got what is a very difficult build to block. He's, he's kind of squatty and he's powerful. He he's got, I saw him the other day. I mean, his back is a mile wide, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he, the problem with Isaiah, and we talked about it last year when we were breaking down the games on the pod, he's 6'2", he plays like he's 6'5". Mm -hmm. He needs to play like he's 6'2". Like that, that needs to be a weapon. You, you can't play with your legs extended and without good knee bend and good bend at your ankles and a flat back. Like you can't play high at 6'2". Especially because he's what he was he he's under three ten now, yeah. So I, I know we're all excited seeing a guy three oh eight. Now we're like, oh my gosh, we have people that are over three hundred pounds. Woohoo! Three oh eight playing high is light. Yeah. If you play high at three oh eight, you are light. It doesn't matter how strong you are, really. He's got he's got to use his height as a weapon, and the way you do that is playing with great leverage. That needs to be the number one thing he's working on. If he can play with lower pads, he'll make a big jump. He will. But we didn't see that a ton last year. We just didn't. Right. Yeah. No, that's that's the thing is whenever he did fire off low and have good pad level, he was incredibly disruptive. He's hard to block. But that comes back to being a technically sound defensive line, edge, interior, all of those things. Like, He's got a big opportunity. We'll see if he he takes and runs with it. Um, I think one guy that that they're excited about is Luulu, moving from edge to the interior. I think part of that is because they have um, you know depth issues on the interior. I think the other part of it is he's just a big ass physical dude, um, really length strong too. Yep. Got length. good length, and I think that. You know, they, they like the offseason that he's had. He had a, all things considered, I thought he had a strong year last year. There were some stretches there where he played quite a bit of football there on the edge and, and did some good things. He's, I think he's, to me, he's one to watch because you never know, like, you're going from a, you're going from like lead singer at, defensive end and rushing the passer and all those things that come with it tackles for loss and making plays on the edge to like standing in the choir and singing over on the edge right it's it's a it's a little bit different hold, but... hold on <laughs> Sit, background singer is not equivalent <laughs> to defensive tackle i think it's well, more of yeah. defensive tackle is essential to the defense but it's an unsung position maybe maybe the base player Perhaps to me, hey, to me, there's no doubt it's the most like I don't even care about the lead singer 
All I care about is the drummer. That's what drives the whole thing. That's really what the defensive line is. But I'm just talking about like. Not a lot of shine. Not a lot of shine on the interior. I don't think there's a lot of guys that are like, yes, I'm moving inside. You Hell know? yes. Yeah. I was overjoyed <laughs> when they moved me from tight end to the interior <laughs> offensive line. Overjoyed. Yeah, I mean, you went from uh, dreaming of catching fade routes over the top of a corner for a touchdown to, you know, holding point and, you know, double teaming. and Holding on for dear life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's the thing is I wonder, I wonder where he is mentally with this because I actually think he could have somewhat of a breakout year because uh, he's got some really nice tools in there. Uh, length, if properly used on the in- interior, can be just as or even more difficult to deal with. So, uh, and like I said, big, strong, physical guy. Um, he's kind of, he's the, I think we know what we're going to get out of Co. Uh, hopefully we see a big jump, but, you know, we kind of know the range. Jordan Kelly, you know, we know what we're going to get. He's, he's still still the most consistent guy. Yeah, right? he was their most consistent guy last season, right? His his ceiling isn't super high, but I know exactly what the floor is, mm-hmm. and that's what's still in spring. I mean, you talk to people. Who's the most consistent guy in the interior? Jordan Kelly. Yep. Tough, physical, good technique, battles like you. You know what you're getting from him. Right, the decent size, but still, what, under three hundred pounds? Yeah. So yep. it's just, I, I feel like you know exactly. Out of all the guys on the defensive front, I feel like I know what I'm getting from Jordan Kelly. Yep. No, nope. I agree. Um, but you know, Lulu, I hope is the the guy that maybe comes out of nowhere and gives us something that we weren't expecting. And then you got the guys, um, Sears, the the transfer from what Texas State. Um, you know, we'll see. I haven't heard a whole lot about him so far, but, you know, he's got some strong tools. We'll see if he can develop. Uh, Grayson Holton, the true freshman that played quite a bit last year. He's small, but he plays with a really, really good motor. That's the one thing that I really like about him, and hopefully he can continue to build some strength and and put some size on. Give me all the – if I'm the opposing offense, I'll take all the other, you know, I'll take all the 270 pound defensive linemen you want to put on the field. Yep. That's just where I'm at with Grayson Holt. Like, seems like he's got an awesome attitude, awesome energy. He's light. Yep. Can't be that light. You just can't, not, not with what teams run in the Big 12 right now. Like, you can't, you can't be that light on the interior if Kansas State is running duo right down your face running power right down your face. It's just, you're not going to hold up. And then you look at what Lacey, the transfer from Notre Dame, he's tiny, Yep, tiny, uh, the freshman, I will say with, when I've been out there, Ashton Sanders has flashed to me more than LeBlanc. Yeah. Now he's short. Sanders is short, but he moves really well. Like he has some twitch to him. He has some pop uses his hands well out of his stance. LeBlanc, I just, I look at him, you look at him physically, he, he just, he has to add strength. Mm-hmm. He has to add some weight. Uh, he needs to hit lower body hard in the weight room. Skinny legs. I've never met a great defensive, interior defensive lineman with skinny legs. Just not a thing. He, he's got to get after it in the weight room. Needs to work on his flexibility. Uh, he's got a ways to go in my mind. But Sanders, with some of the stuff I've seen, he, he He's flashed to me. I'm. Uh, he doesn't have ideal size and length, but he's got he's got some pop. Yeah. No, nope. I agree on both of those guys. Um, I, I'm with you on LeBlanc. He's he's. He he's doesn't big. look as good as I thought he would look. Yeah. He he's he's like height and weight are impressive, but he does not have the build of. Uh, what you would consider a high-level defensive lineman yet he's young yet. he can get he can absolutely get there he needs to he needs to put on some good lean mass kind of soft right now um and that's that's not a, a position and, and you, you don't play you soft. don't mean soft in his play you mean a little fluffy physique yeah physique yeah yep gotta gotta he's He's got to become best friends with Jerry Spitt. 
which <laughs> is a very painful process. Painful process, but he'll get there. Like I said, young and it, <laughs> I know highly ranked recruit and all of that stuff is good, which usually means that the expectations get way ahead of where they should be. Guy's got plenty of time to to work himself into uh, an excellent football player, and I'm sure it's going to come. And these other guys, these older guys, Co, Kelly, Laulu, like they need to make it to where there's not a ton of pressure on LeBlanc to get out there on the field. Yeah, if these older Good guys, point. you got to step up. You got to play better. Right, we. We should not be counting on bringing it even as even very highly recruited guys. You should not be counting on true freshmen coming in and playing significant roles on the interior. Right now it can happen. Look at the, look at the nose guard for TCU last year. Yeah. That kid was great. Dom Williams was great for them, but these, these older guys and similar to what we said about Chavis, like Bates needs to get these guys right. Yep. Right. You got to play technically sound football. You got to play with low pads. You got to be extremely physical at the point of attack. You don't, I, I don't think we have an elite interior rusher, right? But you got to collapse the pocket, man. So similar to the pressure that's on that defensive end group, like I, I view the interior very similarly. I agree. But I don't think, I don't think we necessarily have the physical talent on the interior that we have on the edge. Is that fair to no. say? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, a couple of our edge guys are almost the size of our interior guys. Um, you know, we've got, you got kind of a wide range of, of skill sets that are all useful. And especially if we stay healthy, like we didn't even mention trace Ford. Like uh, he's, He's a guy that's got experience. He's an effective pass rusher, good athlete on the on the outside if he can stay healthy. Like you've got a wide range of weapons at defensive end. Um, you know, interior, we're just thin, you know, we're thin and we don't have what I would consider a breakout player. Um, Co probably has the maybe the the highest upside, maybe Luulu. Uh need to continue to see what how Luulu develops there. Hopefully he takes that and runs with it. He could have a, a really nice year, but yeah, it's, this is edge. Really, I'll just say front seven. Our front seven defensively right now has a long way to go. If, if you're an OU fan, which I assume the vast majority of people that listen to this podcast are, and you expected us to, Pump some sunshine and rainbows about the defensive line. You're listening to the wrong podcast, my friends. Yeah. It's just well, with what we saw a year ago, I I think being skeptical and not pessimistic, but like very cautiously optimistic about this defensive front. I just I'm gonna need to see it, man. It, and yep. I don't think that's unfair. Yep. Yeah, I I I think it's fair. I think it's legit. I think um, you know, it's it's evident whenever you watch last year and, you know, the, a lot of the same kind of most of the same guys, except, you know, Redmond, the guy that just blew away the combine was, was on this group last year. So I don't know. It's, they've got potential to be good. We'll see if they get there. They've got, they've got a ways to go. Good thing. Like I said earlier, it's early in the process. Nobody in the country is where they're going to, uh, where they need to be come September. So hopefully we get there. All right, let's get to call your shot. And we asked you guys how y'all are feeling about OU's D line situation right now. This first one comes from Florida Sooner Four. He says, optimistic, but cautious. Interior seems to lack talent, exterior lacks proven production. Both need to take huge steps for the defense to be what, what we need it to be. I feel like that is a very good assessment by our man, Florida Sooner Four. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Um, cautiously optimistic. There's there's a handful of players on the edge and, and the interior that you feel like have some really good upside, but like it's not like specifically on the interior, we don't have a lot of talented upside. 
like we've got like these incredibly like massive guys that have all these great physical traits. We just pull it all together. They're going to be unbelievable. We don't have that. We have guys that with technique, with leverage, with uh, weight room can turn themselves into good college football players. Like that's what we've got. And it's a different path to get there. Um, and it's typically it's small incremental gains to where you look back at it in September and it's like, Dad Gum, we got three guys that are playing their tails off on the interior. Like when you go the other route where it's talent, it's like every now and then you have a defensive lineman that just like blows through the entire offensive line. It's like, wow, look at what we've got. Like we're not gonna have something like that right now. Those gains typically come way quicker and they slap you in the face. What we have is there, we got some guys that are slowly, I think, going to grow into some really good players, hopefully. And then th this second one, I thought this was interesting. It comes from Booma McNug, which, <laughs> okay. He said, Lord, help us if Co goes down the 2023 version of DG 2022. That seems a little extreme, Booma McNug. That I I think I, I understand what he's trying to say. Yes, Isaiah Coe, there's no doubt he is vital to the interior of the defense, but it it's not gonna fall off a cliff like that, like we saw against Texas last year without Dylan Gabriel. It's just we cannot make that comparison. I'm sorry, Booma McNug. I just can't get there. Yeah, that's Stutzman, actually. He's the only player in the linebacker room that's played any significant snaps for Oklahoma. What so. you just said is not going to make anyone feel better. <laughs> These last couple podcasts made the roster breakdown. I don't think we're making, I we're being realistic though. That's yeah. I, I keep coming back to it. It's not like we're not trying to, you know, spread doom and gloom. We're just, we're being real realistic talking about a, team that went six and seven a year ago yep and still still trying to still trying to to grow into an experienced capable roster i mean that's the difficult thing is everyone there just still just has one year in this defense whether you're a senior a freshman whatever these guys have one year in this defense most most really good teams have like fifth year seniors that have played in the same exact scheme their entire career. And if someone goes down, you may not have a five-star that's jogging on the field, but you have a guy that has been there, you know is going to be in the right place, is capable. Like We just we don't have that on our roster right now, and it's, that's the one thing I think we're really struggling with. Yep. All right, birthday shout-outs time. Happy 26th birthday to Mason McCauley. Happy 50th birthday to Judge Russell Vaclaw. 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 What a name. Vaclaw. I don't know. It's got to be one of those. Yeah. Vaclaw. It's one of those three for sure. Yeah. You don't seem confident. You seem no, like I... you're second guessing yourself. Vaclaw. I Final think answer? Vaclaw. Yeah. Russell Vaclaw. Well, at least happy birthday, Judge. It, yeah, there you go, Judge. Judge, your your excellency, your honor, your honor. Your honor. <laughs> yeah, happy seventy third birthday to Jane McCauley. All right, let's preview the Masters and talk some OU spring ball with our man Eddie Radosevich. But first, Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide ten cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the Loves Connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon across the country. The Loves Connect app unlocks exclusive deals and can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Loves Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Loves Travel Stops. Loves also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones with their expanded mobile to go zone. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Hamore. Opolis Clothing is the exclusive home for all of our Oklahoma breakdown you see merchandise. It? You see it? It is the best. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I like it. Good stuff. 
the the pictures of you on the shirt are so much cooler than the pictures of, i'm just like standing and pointing and you're just like knocking the hell out of people i thought that was the i think the opposite i like the pictures of you yeah but like one you're staring down on the guy like he's just <laughs> lesser than you and then i think you're body slamming joel Klatt in that one <laughs> i think funny. that's who that is uh i don't think so i think that was their tight end i don't know that but looks like a quarterback man we'll call know. it Klatt. it's better it's a great shirt <laughs> Opolis is the best place to get your OU and OKC Thunder gear as well. If you want to live your life in buttery soft comfort, go to opolisclothing.com. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off your entire order. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. And you hungry? You hungry out there? We'll head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter-toasted buns, and ice-cold beer. The food is fantastic, and it is the perfect sp- spot to watch any big game. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. All right, here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Eddie Radosevich. It is our pleasure to be joined by the heart, the soul, no, the soul, of Soonerscoop.com. Eddie Radosevich is in the house. What's going on, man? Gentlemen, uh, what's happening? Yeah, I, 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 you know what? I think about a year or two years ago, I probably would have uh, said, no, that, that's like Carrie or Josh or George or Bob or whoever now. But yeah, I am the heartbeat. I am, I am everything to that side. So I'll just take all the credit and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll come back on the other side of that as uh, I catch hell from everybody else that works over there when they hear well, this. Is this your Super Bowl weekend then? Since you're the heartbeat, is this, is this it? Yes. I, this is one of my favorite weeks of the year. And thank God that Oklahoma started spring ball practice at a normal time this year because it seemed like there for like an extended period of time, particularly in 2019 when I actually went to the Masters, the spring game was always on master saturday which i find to be like a religious holiday in in some kind of fashion so uh yeah i'm I'm as much as i like the spring game i'm glad that we don't have to be down in norman in the middle of a uh windy football field come saturday afternoon i just hope that they're playing golf at augusta the weather's not looking too good mm. that was when, when the spring game date came out the first thing teddy texted me was when's the masters yeah <laughs> yeah i, mean, I was that's, like it's that, not that, that weekend we're good we're it, absolutely it, it good. It became one of those things where it was like every year I just guaranteed myself because Alex Fuller has the big master's party every year, and I I always had to miss it. And thankfully, uh, I think there was even one year that I had a – and this really pissed me off. Uh, we had a rivals camp the next day on Sunday, Master's Sunday, and I'm basically listening to the Westwood One broadcast. It's, it's no way to spend master's weekend. Mm, brutal. That's that's definitely not. Now you mentioned the weather, right? Forecasts for Augusta not looking good, man. How no. how does that affect how does that that affect the tournament as a whole and maybe how does that affect who you view will be in contention when Sunday rolls around with that type of weather? Well, I I I think the first thing that's kind of, you know, and I I guess this will probably be one of the talking points and storylines going into the week was just the fact that uh, you know, with all the live guys coming back to play this weekend, it is kind of interesting if it does rain throughout the weekend and you would hope that it doesn't get to this point, maybe it will be a 54 hole event, which, you know, ironic enough would be kind of funny uh, with all the live guys coming back. But, you know, obviously I think that if it is as wet as they expect it to be on Friday and Saturday, particularly on Saturday when the wind's supposed to be blowing and it's supposed to be cold, um, you know, it, it probably, it doesn't play uh, it, pl- it probably plays as long. The ball's not going to roll out as much. It's not going to be as, um, you know, dry and, you know, you're not going to get as much bounce. Uh, so, you know, obviously it would probably help the longer hitters. I think that, you know, obviously anytime that you go into master's week, it's going to be the usual suspects guys that know the course play well off all the undulations that you get out there. Uh, you know, I-, I think that that's why it's so important to get off to a good start and, you know, I, I think that there's been three players in the last 30 years that have gone on to win the tournament, uh, shooting over par on the opening round. And, you know, I, it's not everything, but I do think, like, if you look at the last 10, I wrote them down. If you look at the last 10 years, 
there's been no player outside of the top 11 uh, after the first 18 holes. And, you know, ironically enough, it was Tiger in 2011. I mean, uh, 2019 that was tied for 11th. And that's the farthest somebody's come back. So you obviously, you know, the cliche line of uh, you can't win the tournament on day one, but you can play yourself out of it certainly comes to uh, fruition at Augusta. And, you know, obviously like 13 is a good example of if it does rain and you're not able to get a whole bunch of rollout with the uh, the tee box back, the 35 yards, that they moved it back kind of behind 12 green. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting. You're not going to be able to go for go forward in two. DJ talked about it today during his press conference. Uh, just as far as, you know, he thinks he's going to be doing a whole lot of laying up on 13, uh, which isn't the most exciting thing in the entire world. But I do think that it's going to affect the way that these guys play, particularly on the weekends once you get to Saturday. And then obviously, once you get to the back nine on Sunday. Yeah, I think the the 13 uh, changes there are really interesting. Always been the or I say always for a long time has been the easiest hole on the course I think plays what four seven seven under par so um I, I what does that do for the overall strategy and you know because there's a lot of par fives that guys try and take advantage of and, and pretty conservative on on some other stuff uh also are there any other ch- changes that are notable that they've done not that any that like I think that just come to mind, uh, you know, like last year with 15, they moved 15 T box back and made that second shot into 15 more interesting. I think it's going to kind of do the same thing this year uh, with 13 in that, you know, you got through 11, which was one of the toughest par fours in golf. You get through 12 and then for a lot of the guys out there, you were going to be able to cut the corner and get home in two on 13 and make birdie at worst. And I think that, you know, now you're going to be putting a wedge into a lot of the players' hands. They're going to need to be laying back. You're not going to see as many guys going for it because you don't want to hit it into the water. I think uh, Tiger on Monday rolled one back into uh, the water. Uh, So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how they play this. It's going to, I think for a lot of those guys, it's going to be a little bit of a test as far as what they are looking to do. Uh, You know, obviously it's going to be different how they play uh, you know, the drive off the tee, you're not going to be able to cut the corner as much because you just simply can't get it over the uh, the trees on the left side of the fairway. So uh, you're going to have to hit it straight and basically hit it straight. And then you're already back 30 or 40 yards. You're going to have to lay up. So, you know, I think for a lot of those guys, it's probably going to, um, I think more than anything, probably be a little bit of a psychological thing, just as far as it's different than what they played. And uh, previous years, but for the guys that are hitting it extremely well, and obviously the, the guys that can get a wedge into their hand, uh, you know, or whatever the number they want to lay up to, I think it's going to be kind of fun to see those uh, second and third shots now go into 13, where, uh, you know, if you're not controlling the ball and it, 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 it you know, if, if you can't put it to where you need it to be, you could get into a lot of trouble. And that's especially if you're going to hit it over the green and into the bunker, or, you know, hit it over and, uh, you know, obviously short and funnel it back into the water. So uh, it's going to be different. I, I don't think that there's anything, any doubt about that. And kind of like how 15 played a year ago where you're trying to have to hit it onto a little bit of a saddle there. Um, you know, I think that you're going to see more and more guys be okay with the idea of laying back and kind of taking their medicine, if you will. I think um, the scoring average a year ago was like 4.77, which is, really good for any any type of hole is really pretty pretty easy for the entire uh, uh the entire field but at the same time if you don't watch it all of a sudden you bogey 11 and then you say you get into trouble on 12 and it's not really the uh you know the it's not the easy birdie that i think a lot of people uh have kind of made it out to be that that it used to be when you could hit it on in two or you know hit it up around the green and then get up and down for birdie Looking, looking at the field, obviously, Scheffler, Rory, Rom up there. When when you talk about the favorites, but who who's coming in hot, right? Who who do you feel is carrying a lot of momentum coming into the event? Yeah, you know, it's it's kind of interesting in that you look at it. It is the usual suspects. Like Scotty Scheffler's hotter than he was a year ago, and he won by he won by three. But let's be honest, he was up by four. He missed the the uh, the par putt on 18. Uh, 
the guy that I was talking about this morning that it's kind of incredible that we've kind of forgotten about, and I say forgotten about, maybe it's just because he hasn't played in a while. John Rahm was like on top of the golf world two and a half months ago, and then it kind of got swept under the rug because Scotty's been so good. Uh, Rory obviously playing extremely well, and you know what he did down at the Players a couple weeks ago. Uh, that's going to be kind of fun to watch. So, like, those are the big three guys. And then you have, like, the Corey Connors who comes in off the Valero Texas Open victory. Uh, and he's played at Augusta surprisingly pretty well. I think the uh, the last three times he's played, I think it's a top 10. I have it written down. I have it wrote down. I had some cheat sheets here. Um, he's gone the last three tournaments or the last three masters he's gone t10 t8 t6 which is a little bit surprising for a guy that uh you know i don't think is necessarily in that upper echelon of player but some guys just play well out there and you know justin rose is kind of in that mix as far as somebody that has had a lot of success as opposed to maybe somebody that you would think would have a good record like a bryson DeChambeau, uh who really hasn't played well at the masters um, or, you know, he missed the cut last year. I think he went 76 80 uh, before he headed home for the weekend. Or even a Victor Hovland who has played well and you would expect him to uh, be in contention, maybe make a top 25 or a top 30, but he's never broken uh, 70 at the Masters. So it's kind of interesting to see, like, and I guess kind of cliche in a way that it's like Scotty, Rory, Rom. Those are like your guys that I think everybody has circled. And then you get into that, that next group of guys, whether it be a Colin Morikawa or a Justin Thomas or a Max Homa or a Xander Schauffele, guys that you're kind of waiting to break through, not necessarily in a major because JT has, or a Jordan Spieth who's wanted it back in 2014 and has been there mightily close here over the, you know, agonizingly close in recent years. Um, Who's going to be that kind of that guy that I think a lot of people uh, maybe wouldn't pick today going into the tournament, but on Saturday, you're going to wake up and he's in contention. And you're going to go, God, I should have known that he was going to be there. Uh, you mentioned these guys, Rory and Scheffler, uh, both coming in hot chance for a couple of rare feats. Uh, Rory has been close, but the career grand slam and then Scheffler, an opportunity to go back to back. No one's gone back to back since Tiger in 01, 02, 20 plus years. Which do you think is more likely? As crazy as it sounds, I guess it would be Scotty going back to back just because uh, he's playing so well. I mean, that puts him he, in rare company. What? Uh, Nicholas, Faldo, and Tiger. That's it, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and the thing about it is, is like, it's almost psychotic to say it, but Scotty's playing better this year than he was last year and he basically scrubbed the field so i would love to see rory i have a soft spot for him i love what he did for the pga tour hero in the last year and a half he's kind of been the leader head in uh or the figurehead in you know the pga tour and the live thing i loved him in uh the netflix special i i would be pulling for rory if it came to that on sunday I think it would be, uh, you know, just as an ambassador of the game, I'd, I'd love to see him in that upper echelon and finish out the major grand slam. Uh, but, you know, I, there, there, you know, sometimes there's a block, it seems like, when he gets to Augusta that uh, even though he's played really well, and I think a lot of people forget that he finished in second last year after he shooting 64 back. on Sunday. Yeah. It was That's the eight good. under that he chipped in on top of Colin Morikawa out of the bunker, and it was kind of lost in the mix that he had made this run and you know tv probably inflated it more than it really was but you know what was he like two or three within two or three uh as scotty barreled into 15 and i think he ended up burning 15 and 16 maybe to to stretch the lead back out but uh he played really well you just hope he gets off on to a good start on thursday and if he can do that i like where he stands he's playing about as well as uh you can remember in recent memory uh, coming in, he's been competitive, and you just hope that he can put four solid days together at a place that has kind of, um, you know, he's he's kind of, I guess, not necessarily failed. I don't know if you could say that, but probably just hasn't played up to uh, the level that a lot of people thought he would. I can't believe we've gone this long without talking about Tiger Woods, but it, the, the weather. We will, we will make do of that. We will make we will make use of uh, Tiger. 
Yeah, but the the weather, if it's cold like it's supposed to be, I I don't think that helps him, right? It doesn't help him keep that leg warm. That's going to no. work against him. But still, how excited are you to watch Tiger Woods play some golf, man? There's nothing well, like it. There really is. Yeah, like it, I, I think it even goes back to, uh, you know, his first time back this year. And it's like he didn't play well. All things considered, he did play well. At the same time, he made the cut. He was in contention there for a little bit. But uh, just seeing Tiger play at Augusta again, you know, I think it. we kind of go back to even before he won in 2019, where it was like you never knew if the guy was going to play again, and he almost died in the car wreck, and then he came back and finally got to the top of the hill in 19. And as cool as that was, it's just there's something about this place that he could get around on one leg and seeing him do it a year ago. And the vibe that came out of that Thursday and Friday, even though the weekend, I think, wasn't what a lot of people wanted it to be for Tiger. Uh, we still get an opportunity to watch Tiger play professional golf at the highest level possible. And, uh, you know, I, I guess to some extent, we just got to be thankful for that, uh, that he can still get back out there, that he can still uh, get it around with some of these guys. But then, you know, then again, you see the way that he played in that first trip back around and. You know, his ball speed's still there. His swing speed's still there. He's out driving JT and Rory. And I don't know. I, I guess the Tiger fan in me wants to believe that he could compete. But there is this element of he doesn't play a whole lot of competitive golf. You've got to be able, you kind of got to be in that arena to be able to, uh, to, to answer when the call is, is made. And I just don't know how well he can hold up. And like you said, with the weather, it's going to be, it, it seems like all odds are stacked against him. But, Hell, that's, you know, that would make any type of run that he made on the weekend that much more special. Yeah, well, you mentioned maybe being a little bit rusty, not playing a lot of um, uh, tour golf. The the live guys, what, there's only been three events so far, right? And, and that's kind of a storyline around those guys that may be coming in a little competition rusty. Yep. Do you see that as something that may hamper those guys? Or is there anyone out of that group? What is it, 17 or so of those guys? Anyone out of that group that you think has a has a good shot? It's really fascinating. And I wish that I like I wish I had a feel for it because uh, you know, Brooks Kepka is obviously playing somewhat well. He's won twice in his last six starts. And I think that he said this after the uh, Live Orlando event. Basically, anytime that you go tee it up and you win an event, you're doing something correctly. Uh, but there is like this element of and even Cam Smith said it on Monday at his press conference, his game's probably not where it was a year ago. He was in the final group. He had a chance to uh, kind of close it out. And I just don't know like what to expect, like what's realistic for a bunch of these guys. They're coming off of a uh, Orlando event that they played at uh, like whispering cat or something like that. It's a, it's literally a public course. It's not Augusta national. Uh, so yeah, like, do we, do we even know how, like, because there's no data for the live guys, like all yeah. these numbers we have for yeah. the PGA tour guys, there's none of that No, for them. And we don't know. We don't know if the courses are hard or not. No, like I, we know I mean, nothing. I, I just, just based off some of the national golf reporters that I listen to, uh, and podcasts, I think shotgun starts a really good, uh, masters podcast. No laying up obviously is really good as well, but it's like, they literally played a public course last week. And going from that to where you can call up and get a tee time to going to this this week, like, how do you differentiate that? How can you tell if a Cam Smith's playing well? Like, I would say the, the three guys that, and it might be kind of obvious, or I guess there's really four. Pat Reed, because he's won there. DJ, because he's won there. And DJ, obviously, he's not the, you know, 50th ranked player in the world, whatever. That, we know that that's not the case. And then Cam Smith and Brooks. And, you know, I, Brooks Kepka has proved uh, to be one of the best players in the world when he's healthy. He says that he's healthy right now. Uh, he made a run in 2019, runner-up finish to uh, Tiger. He's played well at Augusta before. Uh, and then, you know, DJ and uh, Pat Reed have obviously uh, won it. They're going to be at the Champions Dinner on Tuesday night. I just don't know what to really, like, what is realistic and what can you expect from those guys? Because... They have played so little golf, and the golf that they have played, uh, you know, as much as they you want to buy into the tournament feel and the team stuff with Liv, 
it's 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 not a PGA Tour event. It's not it, it's more of a relaxed uh, atmosphere. And that means something like I don't know what that means. But in my mind, that means something. I don't know how you can, can you can prepare and show up for something like this this weekend when you've been, you know, for a lack of better terms, playing in shorts with your boys. Like it's just a different headspace, uh, no matter what they try to tell you or what they say. So no house music in the background at the <laughs> Masters? I don't think that uh, Clifford Roberts, when he uh, envisioned, before he killed himself at the lake, uh, Ooh, I don't that got think dark that, I, uh, th that's part of the history here. Uh, I don't think that he envisioned what uh, the Live Boys have been playing with over the last couple of years, but I don't know. I, I, I'm, I still go back and forth. I'm kind of interested to see what that thing's like when it heads over to uh, Cedar Ridge here in a couple months. You... You mentioned the champions dinner. How how much would you pay to experience the awkwardness of oh. that? I, it seems it, like everyone is mad at Phil. Oh, everyone yeah. already doesn't like Patrick Reed. Yeah. But the the awkwardness at that dinner is going to be incredible. It's going to be. I mean, Bob Herrig from Sports Illustrated wrote a article this week, and he quoted uh, Ben Crenshaw, who is kind of like the. I guess the captain, if you will, of the dinner, he puts it, he kind of, the, 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 the returning champion hosts the event, but I think Ben Crenshaw is there as kind of the figurehead and the leader of state, if you will. And the way that he was quoted, you would think that there's going to be a terrorist attack, like Saudi Arabia is showing up with the live guys. It's, it was almost kind of funny. I don't think it's going to be that bad, but I think that there is going to be some awkwardness and I can't wait to hear just, kind of how awkward some of that stuff is like i think that dj and uh you know maybe bubba to a certain extent i don't think that they're necessarily ostracized as much as a pat reed who i think even the live guys probably don't like to a certain extent is there is there like a dream pairing on sunday maybe between uh one of the live guys and one of the pga guys oh i think that like i mean Pat Reed, Rory would be pretty awesome. For some reason, I go back and forth. I kind of like Brooks Kepka. I don't know if I like some of his antics. I think that he has a little bit of buyer's remorse as far as going to uh, live. I would love to see him in some type of contention. I would love to see some, any of the live guys in contention just for the spectacle that would come on a uh, master Sunday uh, or even a weekend pairing with some of those guys. So, uh, Rory kind of, I guess, because of the, the leadership that he's shown throughout this whole entire thing against any of those guys would be kind of fun. And um, who knows? Like, I like DJ just, I don't know if he like necessarily considers himself part of live. I, I think he's more of just, you know, my bank account looks good. And I don't know. Yeah, really he's like, you I'm playing with, you know, how much money they gave me guys. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> as long as, as long as Pauline is there walking alongside him, who, who really gives a damn at the end of the day. That's a good point. Okay, before we talk some OU spring ball, let's get a favorite, maybe a dark horse, and maybe like a lock for a top 10. Yeah, uh, let's go. I, I mean, favorite-wise, let's go Rory. I'd, maybe that's more heart than anything else. I think he is really playing well right now. There is a sense of confidence that he's playing with. And I think that, you know, what he was able to do a year ago and kind of buoy himself, even after somewhat of a slow start, the closing of a 64, I don't know how much that carries over from year to year, but I do think he's playing extremely well. Maybe I'm not saying like the pressure would get to a Scotty Scheffler by any means, but it's just so, as Teddy mentioned, it's so uh, the odds are stacked against you to go back to back. Uh, the, you know, what the, the task at hand is so great for him to have to carry over, uh, from a year ago, but then again, he's playing really well. I mean, he's already won a couple times this year. Um, uh, you know, Gotta dark be horse some pressure though, too, for oh, um, like, I mean, just to, by himself to, and to everything that goes him. into the week, even before you get to Thursday, whether it be hosting the, uh, champions dinner on Tuesday night, the preparation, the asks that they make you kind of go through as the current champion or as the, uh, the, the, the presenting champion, uh, it's a lot, it's a, it's a lot to, that goes into it and it would be an incredible feat. It would almost be more incredible of what he's done over the last 12 months for him to repeat this year 
than in what it has been over you know the preceding 12 months. So um, I don't know. I'd, I'd go with Rory. I still don't think John Rahm, uh, I almost think he's a little bit forgotten about going into this week. And uh, we'll see, though. That, that It was kind of interesting the way that, like, I, I think it's probably just because we haven't seen him a whole lot here since the designated event. Uh, I guess that would have been in Phoenix before they made the move back over to Florida. So um, that'll be interesting. And then obviously the players didn't play very well. He, you know, had the hot start on Thursday and then kind of faded over the weekend. But uh, dark horse, I don't know. I, I guess it kind of can, it depends on what you consider a dark horse. Like I think Corey Connors is somebody to watch. I know that there's a lot of steam right now for Stuart Hagestad uh, to, uh, I mean, uh, not Stuart Hagestad, uh, the kid from uh, Vanderbilt as an amateur. I think that there's a uh, there's a lot of people that think he could come in and play uh, this week into like maybe a top twenty. Um, now I forget the uh, the kid's name. Uh, it starts with a W. Now I feel like an idiot. But uh, Stuart has. We're clearly no help. Gordon Sargent. Gordon Sargent uh, is the kid's name that I'm thinking of. Sam Bennett's had a hell of a year. He's a Texas A&M Aggie, though. I'm sure that there's a lot of people that won't be wanting to root for him. They actually had a really good story about him and kind of, uh, you know, his dad died. He won the USA Amateur. Uh, he's gone through a lot of hardships in his life. But um, Walter Sargent is a name that I think a lot of people will become familiar with. He absolutely murders the golf ball. Uh, I think that, you know, if you're talking about a guy that can kind of play himself into a tournament, even if he is an amateur and it's a big ask, there's seven of those guys stand at the crow's nest this week. Uh, it's a big ask, but he hits the ball far enough that if the course does play longer because of rain and because of wet conditions, maybe he plays himself into something. It's just a big ask being the first timer out there, uh, as you've seen so many guys before. And then, you know, I think a guy that a lot of people will be pulling for just because of what he's been able to do here over the last year and the kind of the career that he's had is uh, Max Homer. Like, I, I think that, you know, he has two wins this year already. Uh, he's played somewhat well throughout the season. I think uh, he's gone like after the after going win win at the Farmer and the Fortnite, he's gone second, tied 14th, tied six, tied ninth. So he has pretty good form coming in this week. Um, you yeah, know, his biggest thing is getting over the hurdle in majors. And I think that uh, his best finish is at the at the Masters is a tie 48th, which came a year ago. And, uh, you know, for a lot of these guys, it's just getting over that. I think that mental hump. And for him, it would be awesome if he could get into a final pairing or into, uh, you know, a weekend pairing uh, still in contention. So those are kind of, I guess, the. Uh, the list of guys that I'm really looking at. And then you get into the, you know, the Xander Shoffleys of the world or the JTs or Jordan Spieth, who we talked about previously, who, uh, you know, if, if things bounced correctly for him, uh, you could be talking about him being a multi, uh, multi-time uh, master's winner. Uh, if, you know, if he would have been able to close things out. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. This week is uh, truly one of those things that you go, I could talk myself into basically anybody and uh, kind of a path, and then there's always going to be somebody that you uh, discredit or disregard through the beginning of the week, and you look up on the weekends, and you're like, well, why didn't I put him on my fantasy team? I feel like an idiot. Official pick, Rory? Yes. I hope so. Fingers crossed. That would be awesome. Heart or head Rory, heart Tiger. I won't uh, go back on Tiger until he's, like, officially, officially out of it. But, uh, you know, we'll see. And then, obviously, all the Oklahoma guys that are in the field this week, it'd be cool if uh, Victor Hovland could compete in it uh, or, you know, at least have a good showing. I know that there's a lot of people that don't like Taylor Gooch because of the way that he left the PGA Tour, but it'd be cool if he could play well. Yeah, I'd like to see I'd like to see Gooch play well, too. All right, you've been out to several of the spring practices. I'll just leave it open, man. What's What's kind of stood out to you? It's 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 like one of these things. It's like I I want to talk myself into thinking that they've made the turn defensively when you see some of the bodies that they've been able to add. You see the progression of uh, like just for instance, like standing with the linebacker group yesterday and uh, you have Jaron Kanick, Kobe McKenzie, Danny Stutzman taking reps and then Justin Harrington, Desan McCulloch and, you know, Phil Pachotti in there or Shane White or whoever. They look great, but how what does that like how how do you separate 
what they were a year ago and the progression that they're making into this spring. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about that group. I'm cautiously optimistic about the defensive end group that you look at Rondell Bothroyd, you look at PJ out and it's like, he looks, that's the dude. Like that's, that's what you want to look like. That's what you want to recruit as. Um, and then, you know, a safety group that, you know, I thought the first time that we went to practice uh, two weeks ago, you look at that safety group and, you know, Billy Bowman and, and, and Key Lawrence and Peyton Bowen or Reggie Pearson and Damon Harmon, they look great. Like you can start talking about developing depth at a position that has been lacking for so many years. So uh, it's kind of fascinating to see kind of how this whole thing's coming together. I wish that Walter Rouse was able to go through. I wish the tight end position was able to go through a little bit more than what they are right now. But, uh, you know, I, I, it feels like everything's progressing in the right direction. Everybody's saying the right thing. Unfortunately for us, uh, we just have five months to have to talk about it. And that's all that's going to be done in between now and uh, the beginning of camp in August. Jackson Arnold's the other other story. Everyone kind of wants to know what he looks like and um, sounds like uh, he understands that it's going to be a work in progress. But as far sure. as like the tools, the physical traits, all of that stuff, sounds like he looks great. I mean, he, he's he's incredible. I, I you know, I think everybody has this idea of what a five star should look like. And I actually saw him play three times last year for Geyer and Every time I walked away uh, wowing at something different, whether it was him running away from the, Al uh, from the Allen defensive backs. And that was a little bit of an Allen team that was down a little bit, obviously, but um, he's just a dude. And I think that I just want people to be able to kind of caution themselves that because of what Caleb was able to do as a true freshman, I don't know if he has that same skill set as far as being able to just be thrown into the cotton bowl and perform. Like, I don't think we appreciate what Caleb was able to do enough. And maybe, maybe in hindsight, you do a little bit because he did go on to win the Heisman trophy. I know that's taboo to talk about around here, but at the same time, he's going to be so, so damn good in the next couple of years. Uh, it's almost just like, I, I don't want to like preach patience because I know that, like Dylan's going to have to play better than what he did a year ago. And I think that you saw at the end of the year, it started to come on a little bit more, particularly in the bowl game down in the cheese bowl against Florida state. But uh, yeah, like thinking about the quarterback position and what Jackson could be two, three years down the road. And there's a lot to like, man. And especially if you can, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but if you compare him with some wide receivers that step up and evolve in front of our eyes, whether it be, you know, Nick Anderson, who I think looks great right now, just running around. And we haven't really seen a whole lot of what he's been able to do. Uh, but, you know, him and Jaden Gibson, and then you pair him with Jalil Farouk, uh, and then, you know, Gavin Freeman and Drake Stoops and Andre Anthony, um, and then the whole host of guys that are still kind of waiting to come on, whether it be LV Bunkley Shelton or uh, JJ Hester or, you know, Petaway coming in during the summer. Uh, there's a lot to like. Like, I'm optimistic about an offense that was probably a lot better than they, you know, people want to give them credit for a year ago because the expectation of, you know, what that was supposed to be was so grand and so high. I think it was just ultimately disappointing at times, but at the same time is like, they're still top 20 in the country or top 25 in the country. They're still putting up great numbers. It's just skewed because we were so used to, those 17, 18, 19 offenses being historically great. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's just, it's hard. To, I was doing a, a podcast earlier with the solid verbal guys, and it's like hard to like describe how this team was so freaking close in all of those games. And you guys know this. It's just like they weren't able to get away with some of the stuff that they had gotten away with in 17 and 18 and 19. And it just all kind of, came back to bite him a year ago and uh if you can just be better in just small little areas we're talking about the narrative on this program if they're eight and four eight and five a year ago is so drastic than what it is right now when it's six and seven and you guys know that it's just it, it's kind of fascinating to me entering the second year under brent uh and some of the stuff that i think from the outside looking in that i was disappointed about that 
I don't know. Maybe they were just hard truths that they had to be learned and hard lessons that had to be learned. And in the long run, in the grand scheme of things, this program's better because there were some failures in year one. Yeah, the the hard part about it for us, right, when we got to talk about it, is it you, you want to say positive things, but then you sure. remember, hey, six and seven. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I don't know, but you, but it's – I'm kind of at the – I'm going to need to see a little bit before I start – not say I'm not completely bought into the program and Venables and yeah. all that, but I'm just going to have to – you have to see it on Saturdays, right? Like that's just how no, this – that's how this game is measured. Yeah, and it – Unfortunately for everybody, a part of that program right now, you get basically 13, 12, 13 Saturdays uh, every year to prove kind of what you're worth. And it's, it's, I, I guess, frustrating and to a certain extent point that everybody wants these immediate results. Everybody, I think, you know, myself included, admittedly, uh, in some form or fashion, once Brent walked off that plane on that Sunday night down in Norman, it was this defense is going to be better overnight. Everybody's going to know where they need to be. And everybody kind of talked themselves into thinking that just simply because of coaching, they were going to make the steps that everybody wanted them to make defensively. And then you see the lapses and you see the statistics that were at some points worse than they were in uh, previous years. But also at the same time, you saw the growth that Danny Stutzman had a year ago and how we forget that he led the big 12 in tackles. And, you know, I think that, you know, a perfect example of kind of where this program is at right now is like the hype around, and you guys have talked about this on the pod this, uh, in the, in previous weeks, like the hype around Justin Harrington right now, the fans don't care about that because they can't see it every day. And, you know, I, I think that I'm going to take a wait and see approach, or at least I tell myself that. And, you know, before you know it in August, we're going to look up and hopefully he's making a lot of plays. Like there's a lot of guys within that defense particularly that I want to buy into and I want to believe are going to be really big difference makers for this, for this team and for the season. Uh, but we're still five months away from really proving that and being able to see that come out on, uh, you know, come to fruition on the field. So it's exciting, I guess, to a certain extent, it's a little bit scary in a way because in the back of my brain, it's just always like, and I don't think that anybody wants to talk like this, but it's like, what if this doesn't work out and they aren't able to get this thing figured out? But then again, I think that there's, you know, I don't have to tell you guys this. I, I think that there's a, a true belief that everything is going to get figured out and things are headed in the right direction. Uh, you know, whether people outside of the state of Oklahoma want to believe it or not. You got to be able to carry some momentum forward, right? Sure. Like last year we had a ton of momentum uh, with, with Venables being hired and recruiting went well the season uh, did not go well and so far somewhat ignored it seems like recruiting still going really well but you can't afford to, to have two of those years you lose all the all that momentum that you've got which is the other thing the spring game last year record um, ton of people out ton of former players was an awesome event it, any way this year lives up to that like I don't know that we get 70,000 but we still have a Heisman statue unveiling right yeah. we still got a yeah. five-star quarterback that's going to be taking the field there's still a lot of things to be excited about but like wh how do you feel about that it, it it's crazy to me that it's almost just become like old hat that oklahoma's putting another statue up putting another heisman trophy up and i think that like it's it gonna be weird when we don't have one that's like uh in the queue waiting right, right? Right, right. I, I the uh, the sculptors are going to be looking for things to do. Might have to uh, <laughs> may, might have to send them to uh, Oklahoma City, and they can make one for uh, J Dub after the uh, the Thunder goal for the uh, the world title here in a couple of months or a couple of weeks. Big but, one on no, Sunday, baby. Big one. I I'm nervous about tonight. So that's that's where my headspace is at. <laughs> uh, it you know, I do think it's going to be a good turnout. Hopefully you get good weather like we did a year ago. I think that like the spring game has kind of become a celebration of Oklahoma football. And I'm kind of excited to see what that turnout's going to be for Kyler. Obviously Baker's going to be back in town. I think that there's still a bunch of people that are uh, scheduled to be returning. And that thing went so well a year ago. Uh, you just hope that, you know, everybody kind of has the same 
same vibe that they did a year ago and the same energy that they brought for Baker. And I think it should be really cool. And, you know, the, 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 the recruiting thing is so crazy to me too, because if you would have told me that they were going to hold on to basically everybody except Colton Bossick after that Texas game, and then you got into like that dark period right after the Texas game and, you know, kind of the ups and downs that that season had, I would have said you were nuts. And for them to be able to close and hold on to PJ and hold on to Peyton Bowen or flip Peyton Bowen at the very end uh, and really kind of keep that thing intact, get a Phil Pichotti to campus. It was almost, I guess, reassuring in a way that whatever that message is that they're sending uh, recruits and they're telling portal guys, whether it be Walter Roos or, uh, you know, Reggie Pearson or Desan McCulloch or whoever. It's like people are buying in. Now it's time to capitalize and really start progressing towards something that you would want to take down to the SEC in 2025. So, uh, you know, th- it's a big year. It's a big year for everybody involved in the program. And I think that uh, it's almost kind of exciting on a, in a way because of the unknown. I don't like I don't know. I, it's always fun to uh, have high expectations and, you know, be devastated when OU goes 12 and one or 11 and two. Uh, but at the same time. Right now is it, it I, I told some people earlier, it's like Oklahoma football right now is so fascinating and there's so many questions going into the next few years and just maybe even in a grander scale as a whole of what college football is going to look like in 2025. It's um, it's a good kind of fun business to be in right now. Eddie, you're the man. Uh, hopefully Sooner Scoop has not fallen into complete disarray with us <laughs> taking the fearless leader. You never a, know uh, for you about never, 40 minutes. You, you never know. Oh. And you wouldn't be surprised. That's, that's kind of the way that it goes. <laughs> yeah. You're awesome, man. Thanks for the time. Appreciate it guys. Anytime. That man is a wealth of golf knowledge. <laughs> wealth of all kinds of knowledge. That's good stuff. Hey, do you, who's your, do you, are you making a pick to win the Masters? I, I think it would be hilarious if one of the live golf guys won. But I just I don't know how sharp their games are right now. I am I'm gonna take Morikawa. Okay. I, I like him. I think Rory's gonna get it done at some point. Is this the year? I don't know. It seems like the story's kind of lining up with uh the front seat that he's taken here recently. I'm gonna take Rory. I I kind of have the opposite feeling. Like he's got a ton of pressure on him with everything yeah. that's been going on. Like that's that weighs on a man. Sure. Absolutely. And yeah, he's, and not just with everything that's going on, like it's, it's, he's got plenty of golf left. I'm not suggesting otherwise, but I, it gets more and more difficult with every year that passes to, to pull that thing off. Not a spring chicken anymore. Nope. All right. Let's finish up with our winners and losers of the week. But first. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School represents a tradition of educational excellence in Oklahoma City. Grounded in a faith-based education, students prepare to meet their potential with an individualized academic path that strives for success. Bishop McGinnis offers a college prep curriculum that includes 22 AP courses, participation in OSSAA athletics where they've won over 100 state championships, and numerous clubs and organizations for students to join and grow. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, Contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. And attention, business owners. You need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from any insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best-in-class, Connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the week? 
I've never thought I'd have him as my winner, at least not this early. But Hugh Freeze, new coach at Auburn, um, stealing a talking point that I've been pounding for years. Uh, he's suggesting instead of your your normal old spring game, why not play against someone else? Play against another opponent, in-state school, uh, someone local, whatever. Um, you know, spread some of the risk around to where you don't have all 22 of your own guys out there on the field. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit better. Guys get to go up against someone else, see a different colored jersey. I think the fans could have some real interest there. I think there's a way to do it. Um, not exactly sure, like, what the exact way is, but it's at least a cool idea to start thinking about. And he offered up, he's like, you know, maybe, you know, we play Troy and, you know, do it for charity. And Troy's coach is like, yes, challenge accepted. We'll be there. When do you want to play? <laughs> what time? What day? Yes. I, and I, I've heard people talk about this in the past, and I think it's a great idea. Now, I don't think you need to play a game necessarily. I right. think it should be similar to what you do when you have those joint practices in training camp when you're in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Hey, you get individual time, right? Then you do inside run, you do seven on seven, and then you do team, right? You do situational yep. football. That would be, that would be not only would it be really, really entertaining because the fan would get to watch their squad going against someone else. I think it would also, it would educate fans on what a football practice looks like right? and why, why you do some of the things you do. It's like, oh, so they're just gonna go all third and longs here. Okay, that's kind of fun. Let's see, let's see how it goes. Let's keep track. Who who converts, who doesn't? We'll keep score that way. I think it would be awesome. Awesome. I do too. I, I think the perfect way to do it for Oklahoma is in a I bet a bunch of fans hate this, but when we are out of the Big 12 and into the SEC, it needs to be with Oklahoma State. Mm. I, I don't know that any fans would want to see I owe you just absolutely beat up on some like whoever, right? Is does anyone really want to see that? I think you'd rather see like your offense going against your defense than getting a, a real look at some of the young guys. If you're gonna do it joint, I, I think it needs to be a power five school. Um if you're not playing Oklahoma State every year, you don't have to worry about holding each other, like holding things back. And, you know, even though I think that's so overblown in the in the first place, but I don't know. I think that would be awesome. And it doesn't have to necessarily be your spring game, but if they did a handful of joint practices, I think everyone would get a lot out of that. I, I agree. That would be awesome. I think the attendance would be great. I think the revenue you generate from it would be great. And then, and this is a down the road conversation, but we see what is happening with the SEC becoming, for lack of a better term, a super conference. Mm -hmm. And we see what's happening with the Big Ten, something very similar, right? With UCLA and USC being added. It feels like some of the group of five FCS, whatever, like, lower level games against the power five, like some of that's going to get start starting to get phased out. Playing those teams in a spring game is a way to get those teams a check. Yeah. And I, I know a lot of people are worried about, Hey, if the buy games go away, then what happens to those football programs? And honestly, those entire athletic departments, just put it in the spring, man. Yeah. Just match everyone up proximity let's get the old map out say hey you're gonna go you're gonna play them they're gonna play them they're close and we'll cut you a check for x amount wait no i i i'm down with that i i think that's awesome but it reminds me of a funny part of the hugh freeze deal you know whenever he the quote you know the end of the quote is um you know let's you know let's play in state whether we play Troy or UAB or Alabama does or vice versa. Um, we'll do that. Let's we'll adopt a charity, give all the pro uh, to give all the proceeds to. And I can just see the administration being like, Oh yeah, yeah. You know, like 
I love the idea, but the charity thing. <laughs> yeah. We'd love for you to select the charity to donate your proceeds to for your contract, but like we've we've got a business to run here. <laughs> yeah, that's that's good. All right. Who do you have as your loser of the week? You know, it's interesting. I feel like maybe it's just me, but I feel like the Arizona Cardinals have been going through kind of one thing after another, right? They they had a, a bunch of issues. Like, the Kyler Murray contract saga, right? And then last year, some the, the homework field, clause, the homework clause, and then you know you get rid of your your head coach, and now you've got the uh, Arizona Cardinals owner is being accused of gross misconduct, including cheating, discrimination, and harassment in an arbit arbitration claim filed by former Cardinals exec uh, Terry McDonough. So I, it's interesting. He's claiming that, you know, whenever um, um, whenever there was a, a suspension, they had they used burner phones. I, there's all kinds of stuff in there. It's uh, it's interesting. And it feels like Arizona just just can't dodge the bullets right now. It, yeah. And let's not forget your your star quarterback blows his knee out. Yeah. Coming back from a ACL injury. Fire your head coach. Um, yeah, it, these are not great accusations for Bidwell. And if I remember correctly, the burner phones are related when your GM, Steve Kime, yep. he was suspended for a DUI. Right. And when, when you're suspended like that, you, you're not that you cannot communicate with that person. Right. And for him to be like, guys, we're using burner phones. Here we go. That is, uh. Yeah, if that ends up being true, and I guess McDonough, who, by the way, that's Sean McDonough's brother, the the announcer. I'm pretty yeah. sure that's his brother. Wow. I, it, the article I read said he still has the phone. Yeah, which is very said. juicy. Right. Um, he he also said that you know basically, um, it, it was it was essentially a um basically wanted to sabotage Wilkes uh, in the organization as well um, with the way that he treated some of the, you know, the administration guys, which is, it's a lot. I don't, you know, I, who knows? It's all just accusations. So I'm sure, sure there's a, a lot of truth to it. And I'm sure that there's some things right now, whenever it's coming from one side that are maybe, blown up to be more than they are i don't know but it's just more of a mess for arizona to continue to try and slug through dan snyder somewhere he's gonna he's gonna send bidwell an edible arrangement thanks man thanks man <laughs> uh it's crazy yeah yeah not Tough a stuff. not a good look for the cardinals and certainly not a good look for bidwell just you're right it doesn't feel like anything's going right hopkins yeah. is you know he wants out that whole yeah. uh, just that does not seem great. All right, let's no. get to my winner and loser. But first, uh, John Van Auto Group has been serving Oklahomans for 40 years, family owned and operated. They've got nine full service dealerships in Woodward, Miami, Guthrie. No matter what your vehicle needs are, John Van Auto Group has you covered. They carry domestic brands such as Ford, Lincoln, Chevy, Buick, GMC, Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, Jeep, and Wagoneer. John Vance Auto Group's goal is to give unequaled service and to exceed customers' expectations in every way, which is why they have their lifetime loyalty program. Here's how it works. Buy a new or used car. All you have to do is get all of the manufacturer-recommended maintenance done at the Vance dealership. And if something goes wrong with components of your engine, transmission, drive, axle, or transfer unit, they will cover the repair costs. It's a great deal. You can browse their entire inventory or find the John Vance dealership near you at danceautogroup.com. And First Fidelity Bank is a full-service financial institution based in Oklahoma, tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs, checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all. Whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone, everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. Come on, people. Make your life easier and go bank with First Fidelity Bank. Visit ffb.com for more information. All right, for my winner of the week, thought about going with UConn. 
that was, I mean, just a dominant tournament from Dan Hurley and his squad. There, there were a few, it, it looked like San Diego state was maybe going to make it interesting yeah. there for a few minutes, but they, they just completely ran away with that thing. Uh, Sonoga was awesome. They, they were just a dominant team in March and stepped on the gas at like every second half that they played. Just what a, what a run for the Yukon Huskies. Number five since 1999. Incredible. Five out of six. Six Final Four appearances and with five titles. That's impressive. Five and oh in championship games. Wow. And they did. How rare is it to play to a championship and they didn't really even have a close game? They weren't even tested. Yeah. Like when you think control. about when you think about why we love the NCAA tournament, like the last four or five possessions, like just being you're on the edge of your seat. They had none of that. None of it. It's crazy. UConn yeah. fans got to just be relaxed, man. And hey, you picked them as winner. Not easy. Uh, did I see they're the first five seed to ever win? Were they a four seed or five seed? Was it four? Okay. Maybe I had it I had it wrong. Anyways, yeah. good pick. Yeah, thanks. But also, one thing about uh, did you see the videos of the celebration from stores? Do you see yeah. those kids just for whatever reason taking a light pole and ramming it oh, through a window on yes, campus? I did see that. Yeah. What I I will never understand destroying your city as part of a celebration. I'll never get that. I'm telling you right now. When the Thunder win the championship in 2027, if I see people damage in Oklahoma City, we are fighting. Yeah. That's just like, that's that's how it's going to be. Oh, man. Somewhere the guy that owns that building was like, why? What are we doing? What's happening here? I think it was like a dorm or something. Like it was, I, Or maybe it wasn't a dorm, but it was just like an odd kid. Like, what are you doing, kid? And yeah. I bet you all those kids are going to get expelled. It's like, oh. Congratulations on your 10 seconds of social media fame, you dumbass. <laughs> Hope it was worth it. Like, so stupid. I just. Beer, beer will do that to you, I guess, right? I guess, man. All right. But my winner of the week, I'm going with Joel Embiid. And we have not talked a lot about him on here, but the dude is an absolute monster. His skill level at that size is. I mean, it's unbelievable. And I know he, he got a lot of flack last week for sitting out that game against Jokic and the Nuggets. But, dude, he, he may have locked the MVP up with what he did on Tuesday night. 52-13-6 and six in a 103-101 win over the Celtics. Now, a Jalen Brown list Celtics. But the efficiency of the 52, <laughs> I mean, he hit 20 of 25 shots. Hit 12 or 13 free throws. I mean, he just, he's ridiculous, man. It's his third 50-point game of the year. I, I mean, and the 76ers are an interesting team. Like, if Embiid and Harden can stay healthy for a playoff run, who knows? I think they're, they're going to end up being the three seed, it looks like, in the East. But, man, he is, he's a stud. And with the number of games that Jokic has missed lately, and also they – the Nuggets got beat by 20 by the Rockets on Tuesday night, which was one of those that makes you go, what? But I, I think Embiid's got the MVP locked up. That was a that was a statement performance. Yeah. He's he's incredible. And he's he's really developed his game. I don't even know like uh, what the comparison is. There's he's not like, one. Yeah, it's like Dirk and Shaq wedged together or something. I don't if, even know. If Dirk and Shaq had a baby. <laughs> yeah. He's incredible, man. He's to do what he does at the size he is is just it's wild. And you know, he's somewhat I as far as like star power in this league, under the radar. Right? But he's he's not a guy that you typically hear a lot about. You hear a lot about more well known guys that are on far worse teams. He just doesn't grab the headlines for whatever reason, but he's about to win the MVP. You, you hear more about LeBron when he's injured 
can you do when MVP Embiid is well, out there Kyrie, balling? You know, you hear all about Kyrie, and yeah, it's strange. Yeah, but Doc Rivers even said, hey, after the game, he said it on the podium. It was like, the MVP race is over. And <laughs> I tend to agree with Doc on that one. That dude is, I mean, he he is amazing. It, if you have not seen him, like, up close, it's hard to fathom, like, just how big he is. He is huge and, like, gunned up, too. Like, he's big and thick. It's just He's like the biggest human being I've ever seen. It's crazy. Just a I, monster. I don't know how he shoots it so well with how gigantic his hands are. He dude, he, he's a special player and I'm, like I'm hoping he's holding he stays a healthy. tennis ball to try and shoot it. <laughs> yeah. It's like me shooting baskets in my front driveway with my son. My son's obsessed with shooting the basketball and he makes me shoot the little kid size ball. And it's like, <laughs> uh, that's how Embiid feels. Yes. That's All right, good. for my loser of the week, thought about going with Jill Biden. We don't talk politics on here, and this is not political. What are, what are we doing, Jill? The White House is for winners, Jill. You can't even – you. and I know you walked it back, but you can't be saying that Iowa should be invited to the White House, too. You can't do that, Mrs. First Lady. What are we doing? That's not how things work. That's not American. It's – we we may have finally – like. She, I know the uh, the offer was rescinded, and uh, and already turned down by Iowa. Was like, no thanks. But like, this is the door opening. We've become the ultimate participation trophy uh, society. If we're just going to invite both participants of a national championship game to the White House, can't do it's it. It's over. It's un-American. That's can't right. do it. And I, this led me down the. Uh, kind of a path of okay how am I, I gonna handle when my son starts playing sports and they don't win and they try to give him a ribbon or a trophy or something and do you remember james harrison how he handled all that no he just threw him away <laughs> i well i think that's what i i think that's what i'm gonna have to do now hopefully my son wins a bunch but i if i can't get on board with rewarding losing like, I know we care about the kids' self-esteem. Now, these are college kids. This is a completely different conversation. But I just – I I don't think I'm ever going to get there, man. I know we're, we're – there's a big topic of self-esteem and mental health and all that, but I just can't see me rewarding losers. Yeah. Just, I ask my son every time he wins something that's not first place if he wants to throw it away. He's like, what are you talking about? No. Oh no. Um, but it reminds me of a of a funny story. Um why am I drawing a blank? Called the Super Bowl tight end. Greg Olson. Olson. So I guess his dad was a head coach, grew up with, you know, brothers and growing up, like if they won trophies that were not first place, there was this place out in the country that they drove to that they called the uh trophy graveyard. And their dad had him get out of the truck and they threw their trophies into this some ditch somewhere and it's full of full of second third place trophies pretty funny i love that idea make an outing of it make it fun yep. but then get rid of okay i'm stealing that thanks greg olson i appreciate you all right but my it's painful man my loser of the week's no. the thunder again another painful loss and i get it golden state's the best team in the league in their building i get it but no clay thompson but the Thunder were incredible. They were incredible in the first half. Scored 79 points and a half. Warriors had no answers for them. Even though Curry was just shooting the lights out. I think they were like 11 of 22 for three from three in the first half. But when, when the game was on the line, when things got tight in the fourth quarter, the Warriors cranked that intensity way up in those last eight minutes. And the Thunder just did not handle it well. Only scored 19 points in the fourth. Uh, they have now lost four out of their last five. They've lost three in a row. With And remember, that one win was a buzzer beater against the worst team in the league. <laughs> and it, it's and we continue to say, it's great that they are playing these types of games. But man, Ted, this has not gone particularly well. I ho I, My hope was it would go better. I don't know why I expected it to go better 
with it being the youngest team in the league with guys that have never really, you know, especially together had these types of experiences, man, well, fading, fading. The, the expectation for it to go better. It's not that, okay. Golden state is obviously we know how good of a team they are, right? Steph Curry's mating. I the part that bothered me. Don't let Jordan Poole go off like that in the fourth. Come on, man. Anybody yeah. but Poole. Guy's annoying. The the really the frustrating thing is it's not the Golden State loss, right? It's the other bad losses to teams that are the Hornets. Just say it. It was the Hornets loss. The Hornets. God, I was not in a good mental space after that game. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Golden State hits 23s. Okay. It's going to be hard to win in San Francisco when Golden State hits 23s. But the thing right. that that is disappointing, I'm not mad, I'm disappointed. Golden State is not trotting out some super big lineup, right? I mean, they're playing they're playing some athletic dudes, don't get me wrong, K- Kaminga, Moody, uh, all those guys. But you can't get hammered on the boards like you got hammered on boards against Golden State. Out rebounded by 16 against that Golden State team. It just it shouldn't happen that way. So I I just it's not like they have some dominant big. That was disappointing. The the highlight of that game, the the highlight of the fourth quarter certainly was Mark Dagnalt losing his mind. That <laughs> was awesome. And he should, right? You gotta. The refs made a mistake, and they admitted to it after the game. But I think that made some people realize, like, oh, Mark Dagnall, pretty calm guy on the surface, but he's got that crazy in him. He's got that dog in him, Ted. It was fun to see it come out. Yeah, he must be feeling the same way you are uh, recently with, with some of the games, and it finally boiled over. Yes, in a big way. It was an <laughs> awesome clip. Awesome clip. Maybe my favorite thing of this season, but – Here's the situation. It feels like hosting the play-in game is pretty much out the door. That was my hope, that they would be the nine seed. We'd get to host that 9-10 game, and it would be a big event, and it would be a ton of fun. Seems like that's not going to happen. But the simplest way for the Thunder to make the play-in is they beat the Jazz on Thursday, then they beat the Grizzlies on Sunday. If they only win one of those, then they need the Mavs to lose to the Kings or the Bulls or the Spurs. If they don't win either of those, they need to, the Mavs to lose two to the Kings, Bulls, or Spurs. So you've got kind of five bullet points. The Thunder need two of them, right? They can win both, take care of it, or the Mavs can give them some help. So is there any way they can host? I haven't done the math, but it just, it seems unlikely. Gotcha. I have not, I have not crunched the numbers on that. Really? I'm just worried about them winning a damn game, Ted. (laughs) I know. I know. I'm putting the cart ahead of the horse here. Yeah. So right now, Minnesota, no, I don't, because Minnesota has the tiebreaker now. Gotcha. And they are, Minnesota's 44. Yeah. So no. The answer is no. Okay. We don't have to worry about that then. Yeah. Hey. Like Forrest Gump, one less thing to worry about. One less thing to worry about. <laughs> Damn it. We were all so excited. And it's just like, you talk about limping into the play-in. I said, hey, that team looks tired, too. Yeah. Looks like a bunch of young guys that are playing, you know, meaningful games late in the season for the first time, together at least. And they're Gassed. thinking like, dang, do we really want the playoffs? I mean, we want to go through that many more games. <laughs> yeah. No, that's it's good for him though. I still think it's good for him. I'm with you. And on that note, episode 306 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop Sunday. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from three to six on 947 the ref. You can hear me from two to five on Sirius Sex and Big 12 Radio, Channel 375. Hope you all have a great rest of your week. Have an awesome weekend, people. And until next time, we appreciate y'all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.